All right. Brother Ron, if you can give me a thumbs up if the audio sounds good because I don't have my regular microphone. Okay, great. That's great. All right. We're going into marriage and divorce tonight. And uh, this is really going to be a subject that is probably going to shock most everybody here. Uh, and there is a friend of mine, I won't mention him by name, but uh, he actually had sent me a, a message about this subject. And he said, because he was uh, hearing in a study group that he was in, that if you were married, uh, you'd been divorced, but you had remarried, that uh, that you would uh, you actually would have to separate to keep from going to hell. And I'm like, wow. Actually, I don't know for sure if I could say I know where the doctrine came from, but I am very familiar with the doctrine, and I know that um, I think I know where it actually comes from. Um, it was a message. It was delivered back in the 60s uh, is where it first originated from. But I'll start off by saying you don't have to fear that because that's not true. Uh but now we got to prove all this so by scripture so you'll know exactly where you stand. And that's what I think you're going to find very interesting tonight. Uh, those of you that might recall a little while back, I did a message about uh, Genesis and I made a statement about where the scripture says uh, as and a man would leave his uh, mother and father and would cleave to his wife. And I always thought it was kind of a peculiar statement in light of the fact that no mothers or fathers were around at that time for the man to leave his mother and father, cleave to his wife. And then I began to realize that it was actually a prophecy uh, is what it was. So with that in mind, we're going to get started. I'm going to share the screen with you guys so you'll be able to see what I'm looking at. Get to the right one. Okay, give me one second. I've actually got to get the YouTube over. You know, when you're sharing a screen with YouTube, if you don't go to the right thing, you won't see what I'm looking at. I don't want that to happen. All right, so. And share screen. There we go. All right. Now. Matthew 19, this is one of the places, and I'm going to move you guys down to the bottom so that uh, we can see what Jesus is saying here. I'm actually going to use the Hebrew Matthew because it's actually a little bit uh, written a little uh, clearer than what we have from the Greek Matthew. Uh, the Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him and saying unto him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh, or two that is. What therefore God has joined together, let not man Asunder. They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away, put her away? He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. All right, so we get started right there. Hang on one second. Uh by the way, if you can if you can check your microphone make sure you are on mute that way we don't sometimes people don't realize they're not on mute and then they end up saying some of the funniest things we get a kick out of it don't get me wrong sometimes we get a really good kick out of what you guys are saying in the background but uh but i think it ends up being a little bit of an embarrassment later uh so anyway now i want to take you though to the hebrew matthew and I always say this, and I, and I know you guys are probably tired of me saying this, but you got to keep in mind, we never know when there's someone new that might be listening that's never heard me speak about certain things before. So that's one of the reasons why I tend to repeat myself quite frequently on uh, on these issues here. 
So in Matthew's uh, gospel, in the Hebrew version, Nehemiah Gordon, as I've stated many times before, he believes that the uh, Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew is actually more accurate than that of the Greek because of the idioms and things like that. They run, they, they run better together. Uh, I do concur with that. I have studied it quite extensively, and I can certainly see where that's the case as well. So we read here at chapter 19. Again, uh, we'll start, uh, well, we'll just start verse one. It came to pass when Jesus finished these words, he passed on from Galilee and came from uh, came to the outskirts of the land of Judah across the Jordan. There followed him large crowds, and he healed all of them. Then the Pharisees came to him to tempt him. They asked him, saying, is it permissible for one to leave his wife for any matter to give her a bill of divorce? He answered them, Have you not read that he who made them of old, male and female, he created them? That right there, verse 4, is one prime example why the Hebrew Matthew is more accurate than the Greek that we have. Let me take you to verse 4 here, and it's actually very important. It's, it's very key to this whole issue on marriage and divorce. He says, have you not read that, uh, that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? All right, and then it's period. But there's a little part there, and what he quotes here is more accurate even to the Hebrew scriptures and Genesis. He says, have you not read he who made them of old, male and female, he created them. The them is very important because it shows that they were one being. All right. If you go back to Genesis and, and uh, I'll tell you what, let me do it separately because it's really Genesis. Uh, well, maybe it is Genesis too. Let me go see. No, I, I'm almost positive it's actually in Genesis chapter one. So let me let me go to the other one instead. Genesis chapter. I hate spam junk. Genesis chapter. Oh, still sorry, wrong one. Chapter one. Here we go. Okay. Okay, here we are right here. And God said, verse 26, chapter 1, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them, okay? Remember, Jesus said he created them, both male and female created he them. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle, and over the earth, and over the creeping thing, and creepeth upon the earth. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Okay, and there it is right there. Zacha unakeva bara otam. He created them. The Hebrew Matthew, and I know this might sound kind of like really silly it's like why steve why are you going into this there's a very important reason to understand this okay and we're going to get into that in just a moment let's see i have to move you guys around so i can move this around so we're in verse four okay zacha zacha uh unakeva bara uh im or am it's uh, it's 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 the letters are written all as one there one word whereas they break it up as two words in Genesis but it means exactly the same thing so he created them when you go to Genesis chapter two though God is no longer uh, now you have they say that there was no man to till the soil. And then he takes and he forms man from the dust of the ground. This is what we have in Genesis chapter 2. But in Genesis chapter 1, they are created in the image of God, and they are created as one unit, one being, male and female. He created them, 
and they had dominion over everything. Now, some people think, well, Genesis chapter 2 is just a more in-depth view of how God did the creation. And I disagree with that uh, because there's a lot of issues on why I disagree on that issue there. But um, let's see. And because now in Genesis 2, now the woman is being taken out of the man and she's being totally made separate. And that also goes to show that when he created them, they were not separated. And it's very important that you keep that in mind because that's exactly what Jesus is going to say a little bit later. Jesus is going to say, you know, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. All right. So let's come back now then to Matthew. We'll continue on. He said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and cleave to his wife, and they will become one flesh. If so, they are not two, but one flesh. What, whatever the creator has joined together, man is unable to separate. All right. Now, if you recall, like I said, back when I saw this a long time ago, or a little while back, I should say, he's quoting it from right here from verse 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And the thing was, was God had just spoke about how he had taken and he'd put the man into a deep sleep and he takes the 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 rib is what they normally translate that as a rib from his side closes up the flesh and from that he takes and he makes a woman so undoubtedly the woman had to be inside the man before he took her out and that's even obvious from the mere fact is when we read up here earlier um and it says here then the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and he breathed in his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. But the word that he uses here when he says, nishmat, that's to breathe, but it's chayim. It's the word, just like this word right here, chaya, which is a singular form, but up here it's in a plural form. But and when he says, and, he, and, and man became a living soul, that's because he as an individual is a living soul. But when God breathed into that body, he breathed the chayim in there. There was everything, in other words, everything that was created in Genesis 1 is now being breathed into a flesh body on the earth in Genesis 2. And why? Because they were one. They had not been pulled apart. And this is what happens even in this whole creation of chapter 2. In fact, I was reading in one of the writings uh, of the early Christian writings. Uh, in fact, Dr. Pagel, I shared this. Maybe you guys have not heard this as of yet. But Dr. Pagel, uh, she was the very... Uh, uh, researcher from Harvard that examined the Nag Hammadi writings from Egypt that were discovered. She's also the one that coined them Gnostic writings. And I listened to her in a recent, um, uh, an interview she did a few years ago, and she said, I greatly regret ever giving them that name. She said, but you have to understand, in the beginning, we had no idea what we had in our hands. We didn't know what these writings were about. She said, now, granted, not all of them I would consider to be different from Gnostic. She said, but out of all those writings that we received from Egypt, she said, five of them, I would actually now call them early Christian writings. Imagine that. And so, and when I look at that, and then I think of some of the things that I have found in there, and there was a reason why I was going to share that with, oh yeah, I know what it was now. 
It's where, because in that in those writings there, the very ones that she calls the early Christian writings, and I think it was from Philip's work, it may have been Thomas, but I believe it was actually Philip. He said that death did not set in until Eve was taken from Adam's side. And then death set into the human race. Wasn't long after that, we had the first murder on the earth. When Cain right, rises up and, and, and kills his brother Abel. And this is what he writes about. And he, and he actually says, if the woman ever comes back and becomes one with her husband, death will cease to reign. And when I read that, it really began to make sense to me because then I understood the marriage and divorce so much better. Because now I realize what marriage and divorce was really about was us becoming one with Christ. That's why I have stated so many times when you look here in Genesis 2 and we get down here near the bottom, you know, he's already here. He's created them. He's breathed in there, by the way, like I said, the breath of life. It was a plural form, just like we have here. The tree of life also was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And there again, you can see the word chayim, you know, you, you can just tell by the characters. I highlighted it in purple, but you can tell they're the exact same word. The only difference you have here, the letter and this one, the letter hey, which means the. So when they say the something like the boat or the tree, uh, they attach the word the as because it's a singular letter to the word itself. He didn't have to say he breathed the life into them. He breathed life into them in a plural form. But the man becomes a living soul. Why? Because God is taking Eve out of him. And so therefore he's referred to as a singular. And this is why we have here Chaya. And also as another interesting thing is, is that the Chaya is feminine. Why? This is where men are referred to in the feminine as the bride of Christ. All right. So as we go down, and you'll see why this all plays in with marriage and divorces in just a little bit here. We're going to get to all of that. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. We're looking at this allegorically nowadays thinking that when we get married you know we're husband and wife now and we're one flesh now no you're not when this is fulfilled then you're one flesh and how do you become one flesh to fulfill genesis chapter 2 verse 24 when you become one with christ when you are married to him then you are fulfilling this very prophecy right here. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother. That was Jesus himself. And shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Now, let's look more at what's written in Matthew. Uh, I'll go to King James just to make it simpler. Wherefore, they are no more twain, but one flesh. What that, what that for God has joined together, let not man put asunder. So if God has made you one with Christ, nobody can break that union. No man, no magistrate, no judge, no nothing. Again, this is not really dealing with the physical marriage, but he gets into that because they didn't get what he was talking about. They say unto him, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? He said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. That's interesting. He see, he, even though he realized they didn't get what he said, so he just tells them, because of the hardness of your heart, God, Moses, he, get, he, he suffered you to put away your wife. But from the beginning, it was not so. 
there was no such thing as marriage and divorce, is what he's saying. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, now he's going to give you an example, except it be for fornication and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, committeth adultery. Now that's the one right there that scares everybody. Whoso marrieth her which is put away, doeth commit adultery. This is in relation to the fact that they've had an adulterous affair to begin with. That there has been an adulterous affair. But the thing is, if she's left her husband and he's the one that's committed, a, committed adultery, then it doesn't even apply to her. And Jesus kind of figures you have enough sense to figure that part out. All right. Now, I'm going to prove to some things about this. So just so you know, let me come over here to ver verse nine over here. And I say to you that everyone who leaves his wife and takes another, if not for adultery, commits adultery. And he who takes her has been divorced, commits adultery. Again, it's all because of that. Now, the odd thing is in the Nakamadi, the Egyptian works that they have, there's actually a verse in there where he says, those who have relations with those that are unlike them, this is fornication or adultery. And by the way, what he's referring to is like in the case of the fallen angels when they came down and cohabitated with the women, they were not like them. That was considered a fornication. Now, let's kind of go a little deeper with this, though. In Romans, know you not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, keep that in mind, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. That you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Now Paul is showing you that this whole deal with the law does not even apply to you if you have taken Christ on as your husband. He knew it. You, you are basically, somebody's got a mic not muted. If you could please mute it, please. So when he says here, wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. Amazing. So the important thing is, is that, uh, is that once you have become dead to the law, now if you're still under the law, remember how the scripture says, he that is guilty in the least, you know, in other words, if you want to take the law, you're going to be held responsible for every word in that law. But if you're married to Christ, the law no longer applies to you. Now, it's not a free license to go out and sleep with anybody and everybody you want to and still think you can, you know, live in a married life and everything is all hunky dory. But. The law didn't apply. And I'm going to prove that scripturally to you in just a second. But now we are delivered from the law that being dead, when I missed something, verse five, for when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. That's all the law can do is bring death. 
But now we are delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner, manner of con concupiscence, for without the law sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. Now, I want to show something to you you're going to find very fascinating. Leviticus. I believe. Let me go. Can't see it because everything's covered. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10. The man that committed adultery with another man's wife, even he that committed adultery with his neighbor's wife, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall be put to death. That's the law. Very similar to that, when Moses gave the writing of divorcement, he allowed Israel to divorce their wives. But if you'll notice, because it was under the bondage of law, the man could divorce the woman, but the woman couldn't divorce the man. Why? Because it was under the law. And here we have a law written by Moses right here in the book of Leviticus, Given a command, and there's many more like it here. The daughter-in-law sleeps with her, you know, the man that lies with his daughter-in-law, you know, they both get put to death as well, right? But the verse 10 is the one that's very important. The man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Now, that's under the law. But if you take Christ to be your husband, that law is not bound. And we know that from this right here. In the Gospel of John, chapter 8, and the scribes and Pharisees brought unto, a woman, brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. I just read to you what Moses wrote in Leviticus. Now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what, what do you say? This they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger he wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went one out by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing in the midst. And when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned you? She said, No man, Lord. Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. The end of the law had come. But it's only an end if you believe that Jesus Christ truly is your husband. If you become dead to the law and take him in as your husband, that law will not apply to you. There is mercy when it is Christ involved. Now the law still exists. The law is still there. It's up to you though, whether or not you're going to die to that law and accept Christ as your husband. Because the true marriage and divorce is about your relationship with him. Sure, you may make mistakes. You may have already made a mistake in life. You may have been divorced, got remarried again, have children and stuff like that. But you are not bound by that law. Yes, there was a mistake made. 
But the thing is, is you don't have to go put the one away now. All right, let's look more, not just to that. Let's look some more of this. This is another interesting one. This is not directly on marriage and divorce, but we're going to do one more on marriage and divorce. But then I want to double back at the beginning. Jesus says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that, my, that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is a hireling and not the shepherd, Whose own the sheep or not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he is a hireling and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and I am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. He's given his life so that that law can be dead for you. In 1 Corinthians, Paul also speaks about marriage and divorce. And I've always found his a little interesting. Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good, it is good for, for a man not to touch a woman. And nevertheless, and when he's talking about touching, he's talking about going uh, a little further than just, you know, shaking her hand or hugging her neck, by the way. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power over her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power over his own body, but the wife. Notice the difference in Paul's message and that of the Pharisees under the law. Under the law, it's just the opposite. The wife has no power whatsoever. She is property of that man. That's what happens under the law. So if you're going to look at marriage and divorce based on the law, then some of those horrible things are going to apply to you because you're not dead to the law. And you've not taken Christ to be your husband. He came and paid the price so that you could be free from that law. Because truly, if you're not married to him, you will find yourself on the other side on the day of judgment and you'll be judged according to the law. This is what really troubles me about people that are in, if they're not in what we call Hebrew roots, but they still are very much holding to the law, they don't even pay attention that Jesus doesn't go by that law. I mean, Leviticus plainly says the man and the woman are to be killed. So how do you justify Jesus saying to the woman that no, she doesn't have to be killed? She doesn't have to be stoned. What about the woman that come to Jesus? Remember when he goes to the well, he asked the woman to give him a drink? And he says to her, go get your husband. She said, I have no husband. He said, you said the truth. You've had five, and the one you're living with now is not yours. Now, he never even told her to go put him away or go leave him. If you don't leave him and everything, you're going to be found in judgment of Almighty God. He never even said that. He actually referred to the one that she was living with, even though it wasn't her husband. He still referred to it as her husband. Ever notice that part? Not many people do. He said, go get your husband and come here. He knew she was still married, and he still referred to it as her husband. Mainly because she lived with him as a husband. Because she says, sir, I have no husband. He said, well, you've told the truth. You've had five, and the one you're living with now is not yours. Think about that, right? 
Defraud you not one another, except to be consent for time, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, and Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. If you go further down, he says, but if she depart, let's see, and unto the married I commend, yet not I, but uh, not yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. But if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any man hath a wife that believes not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which hath a husband that believes not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband, else your children are unclean. But now are they holy. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases. That's interesting. They're not under bondage. But God hath called us to peace. For what knowest thou, wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband, or knowest thou, man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? So see, Paul's just giving you some basic instructions of what to do due to the conditions that they were dealing with in that time. And of course, in the days we live in now, the whole issue of marriage and divorce is such a, is turned into such a mess because there is marry and divorce, remarry, marry and divorce and remarriage and stuff. It's going on everywhere. I get that. I understand that. But what I have learned that has just blown me away is that the true marriage is not even in the physical. When it talks about that committing adultery, it has more so to do when you're married to Christ. And here, like, let me give you a good example of that. When you have accepted Jesus Christ to be your Lord and God, he's your father, he's your husband, he's everything to you. And you've taken him to be yours. But you still hold on to the law. That's, that's still uh, running around with another husband. I know that's kind of hard to say, but it's true. So as we go back and we look at this again, remember in Genesis chapter 2, therefore shall a man leave his father. No, let's watch this. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Okay? She was taken out of man. His wife was taken out of him. I want to really make that strong. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Wow. Because why? What did Jesus say over here? The Pharisees came to him, tempt him. They asked him, saying, Is it permissible for one to leave his wife for any matter and give her a bill of divorce? Remember, the law only gives the guy the privilege to do that. He answered them, Have you not read that he who made them of old, male and female, he created them? That's one being. He said, therefore, a man, now he quotes it, shall leave his father and his mother and cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. That was a prophecy of Jesus Christ becoming one with you. He is the second Adam. The first Adam was separated from, the wife was separated from him, and death set into the human race. And as Philip wrote in his book, if the woman ever comes back and becomes one with her husband, death will cease to exist. That's why when you are in Christ Jesus, in other words, you are married to him, not just formality, oh, I believe Jesus is my Savior, but you truly become one with him. Death has no hold over you whatsoever. And you're not bound by the law. And if you're not bound by the law, if you've made the mistake, I don't say it's the right thing to do to go through to marry and remarry and things like that. But it's not a sin such as the point that you should be put to death. Because let's face it, the brother that wrote me that question, they said to him, and I'm going to say it in plain English. 
if you, they said, if you married and you got a divorce and you went and married someone else, they said to him that you, unless you put that person away and go back and live single, you will go to hell. That is no different than when the law said in Leviticus that if two of them are caught in adultery, they're to be killed, both the man and the woman. And then Jesus takes, and the woman comes out there that's caught in that adultery, and he says, whoever among you is without sin, you go ahead and stone her. When you've entered into Christ, there is no death. Death ceases to be. How could you ever be said that you would go to hell because you married again? Or you might have been married three or four times. I don't know. I've, I've known people to be married seven times. You know, a lot of times they didn't know no better. Well, maybe they did know better. But if you're going to judge yourself based on the law, then yes, you got a lot to answer for. I'll agree with that. But if you take and you place yourself in Christ and you're married to him, death will cease to reign over you. And that's the true marriage. That's the one Jesus was talking about. If they are no, not two, but one flesh and whatever the creator has joined together, man is unable to separate. And he's not talking about physical marriages on the earth when he's quoted that right there. He's talking about you and him. Remember where Paul said, I espoused you a chaste virgin to Jesus Christ. And there's another scripture I think of too. You know, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, do not grieve the Holy Spirit, you know, because of sin, things like that. I'm just paraphrasing that, you know, because you keep making mistakes, you keep doing something wrong, you know. Grieve not the Holy Spirit whereby and you are sealed. Actually is what it says, whereby you are sealed unto the day of your redemption. You see, because if you're sealed, if you have sealed, in other words, that's a covenant consecrated marriage to Christ. You're still going to make mistakes. And he's only telling you, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Because it does grieve him when we do do things wrong. But he's not going to send you to hell because... You went and got married, divorced, remarried again, or two or three times, or whatever the case may be, because the marriage to him is what matters. And of course, from here on out, that's what you want to do. You want to try not to get back involved in that again, you know, and there's many people I'm sure that will listen to this and they're really, maybe they're contemplating a divorce already. You know, and they're looking for, can I remarry again? Um, you know, I'm not going to say you can't remarry again. Because that would not be true. But if there's any way you could avoid it, avoid it at all costs. But there again, you have other situations, too, where women, especially women, they get into an abusive relationship where the man is beating them or whatever the case may be. You're not bound to something like that. Do not think that you're bound to be abused and that to be acceptable in the sight of God. It's not. You're not under that law. Because under the law, that's pretty much what happens. A woman gets to be abused and everything else, and it's no big deal because the law puts him like an authority. Almost like in some places you really read, as she leaves her father's house, then she goes into her husband's house. Be a spouse to Christ. That's where you really, that's where the true marriage needs to be. All right, I'm going to stop here from this point. And uh, if you guys have any questions, I'll try to do my best to answer those. So change it to gallery. So if you got a question, want to throw a hand up or something, I can answer it. Uh, or just if you don't know how to do that, just unmute your mic and I'll do what I can to answer questions that you might have.
did I answer everybody's question? Probably not. You're probably going like, wow, that was one I wasn't anticipating on hearing. So, you know, you really got to see, though, the fact that this whole thing was a prophecy, and it's all about being married truly to Jesus Christ. It's not really anything else. Let me just check the chat, too, because I know sometimes... Oh, goodness. Yeah, there's a bunch of them over here. So... Uh, not questions, or just people putting the scriptures up there. So, just looking to see if there's any particular question or anything. Yeah, as far as to Jen, when you're dealing with spiritual adultery with Israel, that was a different issue altogether that Israel was involved in. But that is true. In fact, God says to Israel, he says, uh, he put her away in divorce. And he says, I'm married unto you. He says, return unto me. And yet she'd been playing the harlot all along. Um, you know, so a lot could be said there as well. Anyway, all right, guys. Well, I certainly uh, enjoyed getting to speak with you guys tonight. I don't know if it helped everybody, but uh, but just keep in mind, you don't, you're, you're certainly definitely not going to hell as a result. Um, and like I said, you can look at all the laws that, you know, Jesus totally went against. Even like, for example, another, I'll give you another example where it says, in the, uh, it's actually written in the law of Moses, um, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And Moses says in there, he said, you, or excuse me, Jesus said, you've heard it said of them of old time, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. He doesn't even attribute that to Moses. You ever think about that? Jesus said, you've heard it said of them, plural, of old time. He said, but I say unto you, if he compels you to go a mile, go with him twain. If he takes your coat, give him your cloak also. So he go, totally goes against that law. And yet it's attributed to Moses, but Jesus doesn't really attribute it to Moses at all when he says, you've heard it said of them. You know, but the one when it comes to stoning the woman and the man, he didn't, he totally went against that law completely 100%. And the funny thing is, when he said to them, whichever one of you that's without sin cast the first stone, they also, all 10 of them, went against the law as well because of their own conviction their own conscience sake they couldn't deal with it so anyway god bless y'all y'all have a great night and we will uh, i'll get this posted so people can see this here a little bit later